Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Steven Mercer and I'm an instructor at the University of California San Diego Extension College Counseling Certificate Program and I'm also a independent educational consultant helping students and families think about and apply to colleges that fit them. And today I'm really honored to have what I consider to be a tour de force of a panel who's going to talk about gap years, especially in this time of uh, pandemics and upheaval in our country. A lot of the videos that I've been recording recently have had a lot to do with all of the changes and the um, uncertainty around college admission and helping people to make decisions about that. And one of the big topics that has come up over and over again is a gap year and whether students should take a gap year or whether students uh, can take gap years. So today I'm, I'm so honored to have a group of people here that are gonna be able to talk to us about this idea of a gap year from a lot of different angles. Um, so I'm gonna introduce everyone briefly and then we'll kind of dive right in. Um, first, we have Ethan Knight, who's the executive director of the Gap Year Association. Uh, and then we have Jane Soroyan, who's uh, the founder of J2 Guides and is a gap year counselor. And then we have Solly Chase, who's a recent high school graduate and is a current gap year student. And we're gonna hear directly from him about what he's got going on this coming year. So welcome everyone. And Ethan, I'd like to start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about the association? And I'd like to hear a little bit about your perspective on gap year in the United States. I know this is something that's been increasing a lot recently, but also more specifically, what's what are the changes you're seeing with the pandemic and all the uncertainty around these types of decisions that people are making? Brilliant. Well, well, those are sort of the big questions, and and um, thank you for starting small, um, tongue in cheek. Those are big questions. Um, um, yeah. So just ever so briefly, um, th so the Gap Year Association, that's our nonprofit. We're a membership based nonprofit. We're headquartered in Portland, Oregon. We've got an office. Uh, well, a coworker who lives in Boston. We both work from home. Um, and really, the goal is to expand the reach of the gap year. Um, there's there's really four main sort of quarters or, or pillars of the work that we do at the association. Um, one is uh, about research, trying to understand the outcomes. There's three current uh, large large scale research efforts that we're doing. Um, another in is resources, just so families can understand how to navigate the gap year. What are the options ahead of them? What's it look like? Be they a planning guide, college deferral policies, or lists of gap year programs that they can start searching from? Um, we also focus quite a lot on uh, equity and access. Um, we're keen to see this uh, really enter the lexicon of the American educational system for more students. Honestly, everybody who has taken part in a gap year or witnessed someone that they care about on a gap year will, will certainly vouch for the outcomes, the benefits that they uh, afford the student. And of course, naturally, all of the impacts, the ripples that that individual student's life leans into. One of my favorite quotes is by Howard Thurman, don't ask what the world needs, ask what makes you come alive and go do that because what the world truly needs is people who have come alive. I think that as a motto for the gap year is it's, it's one of the perfect ones. And then the last thing that we really focus on is, is that of standards, standards and accreditation. Um, us as a nonprofit, we're recognized by the U.S. Federal, um, the Federal Trade Commission and the U.S. Department of Justice as the standards development organization for gap year education, um, which means that we, we get to create great protocols and standards for gap year programs that are entering the field, as well as for gap year consultants. Um, Jane's gone through our accreditation standards and is an accredited gap year consultant through us. And um, she's doing great work and we couldn't be happier to back each other um, in this in this long drive. Um, as for the gap year generally, um, more students are doing it. We know that that's seeing um, a significant increase even before coronavirus. Um, uh, over the last 10 years, the increase year over year has been as high as 40% compared to the previous year, as low as I believe 4%, depending on you know whether we, we were in the middle of a recession or not. But averaging it out, it's about 20% year over year over the last 10 years that we've seen the, the numbers of students grow taking a gap year. Now, I think it is important to highlight that most students who take a gap year, um, um, they don't think about it as a full year. Uh, most students will do a semester of time or cobble together a bunch of independent experiences. And I'm thrilled to have Solly to share the student perspective because um, that's going to be a great contribution. Um, but otherwise, you know, what we've seen is, is the gap year in coronavirus terms. Um, as this has really come about, inevitably, we've seen our, our web traffic grow 300% above normal um, um, on average. The, the, the press are coming at us quite a lot. What it is, is it represents a real opening um, and, and a lot of opportunities that are coming with that. Um, 
Um, inevitably, the same circumstances that hit a college or, or the country around coronavirus, we're still bound by those same sets of circumstances. The difference is that we're working with cohorts of 10, 12, or individual placements rather than a campus of 20, 30, or 40,000 students. And so the ability to be socially distanced, have strong quarantine protocols, um, manage and enforce personal protective equipment rules. Um, all of that's much more doable with a smaller cohort. And so I think that's where we've seen a lot of opportunities. Now, one of the things that's also really interesting, of course, not surprisingly, the gap year historically was, was overwhelmingly destined overseas. And, and there's a lot of interest and a lot of great outcomes that come from that. Um, um, inevitably, that, that makes a lot of sense. Not to say that you can't have a great domestic experience, um, but those who were taking a gap year, I'd say, you know, at some level, 70 to 80% of them were taking some time overseas. Now, with that coming into question with coronavirus, we've seen we've seen an onshoring of gap years back to the states. And there's a lot of things that I'm really excited about that, you know, uh, that that represents an, ex an, an increase in exposure that represents um, more accessibility as organizations have had to navigate really innovative opportunities, be they hybrid, be they online or still in person. Um, and we're seeing a lot of innovation in, in terms of programming. AmeriCorps is, is changing a lot of the things that they're doing in order to be responsive to the economic hardships that are on the other side of this and still recognizing that there's a tremendous amount of need out there in the country. And so if this can be somewhat purpose-driven, um, volunteer or service-oriented, I think we're about to watch a, a sort of a, a whole generation of youth re-engage in the American culture in support of one another because there is really that much hardship out there. That, that's my optimistic perspective ahead. That's really great to hear. You know, you mentioned kind of a hybrid or creative responses to what's going on with the, the way gap year programs have traditionally been carried out in, in now in face of the pandemic. Can you give us like, an example of, of you know, a program that you know of that has made a change or is doing something creative to accommodate gap year participants? Sure. Um, well, so so here's a, a list of some changes that a lot of organizations are doing. Um, many are shortening their overall program length, partially because there's a lot of uncertainty out there and it's easier to manage a tighter timeline, but also because you can reduce your program costs and make it more available, understanding that there's some more increase in economic hardship. We've seen some organizations start early, like some organizations are starting their programs as early as August to be done by Thanksgiving, and others are starting later in October to be done by Christmas or the new year. Um, um, a lot of organizations are having to, to think through, I mean, it's one thing to go at the 10,000 foot level, it's another thing to go to the five foot or the five inch level around what's a quarantine actually look like for two weeks, right? How much time do you have to sort of invest where the testing availability, and so a lot of our members inevitably are, are taking, there's a couple great courses out there by Johns Hopkins to be a contact tracer, to be the most informed person that they can possibly be when they're building out all of these curricula, risk management plans, risk mitigation strategies. Um, we're really leaning into that. Some of the things that I think are really innovative, um, there's a new program out there, design or model, where it's like, well, we don't know if you know how how much we're going to be able to travel come the fall. We we just don't know what that's actually going to look like. We're very cautious around making sure that we're not the vectors going into under-resourced, underprivileged communities. That's a really important sort of ethical line that our field is. I'm, I'm really glad to see happen. But um, um, generally, we're also seeing that that sort of imagine a program where a student will go to a a, a campus or a house, a small house house, small group of people. So if I have to be stuck online in my house because that's the only opportunity that's out there, then do I want to do it at home where I've been for the last six months? Or, or do I want to go somewhere else and do that with the occasional opportunity to maybe foray out and have a great sort of outdoor experience with a different group of people? And so I think there's a lot of organizations that are thinking through, okay, what's our plan A, B, C, D, E, F? And then how do we layer it so that students can have sort of a minimum high quality experience or medium quality experience with the opportunity to have these individual high quality, high touch, you know, get out and actually have more in the experiential realm. Because I think sort of one thing that really does strongly characterize the gap year in the States is that essence that it's an experiential, it's got to be experientially grounded at some level. So doing it all online, um, um, you're going to see some good benefits, you're going to see some good education, but it, it needs to have some sort of grounding into an experiential modality. Okay. So one of the things that I've been talking to colleges about in as they are planning to either either they're very certain about their plans for next year or they're up in the air, uh, most of them saying they're really up in the air, even though they may be coming out with 
you know, trying to be, uh, project some confidence about their plans, they realize that things are going to change. But one thing that keeps coming up over and over again is the extraordinary additional costs that their uh, uh, plans for bringing students and faculty and staff back into an educational campus, right? Or some type of mode, even if it's online, but, but housing, um, testing, uh, PPE, all these things that they're looking at their budgets and a lot of colleges are getting really nervous about this. What are you seeing? Is this impacting gap year providers in the same way is cost? I mean, I would assume costs are going to increase, but is it, how much of a barrier is it to these programs to, to, to operate? It's interesting. Costs are going to increase. Uh, there's, there's, there, there's no way around that. Um, um, imagine, imagine like a, a, a mandatory two week quarantine, right? So you have to have your normal staff to student ratios, but then you also have to have redundancy built in into your staff. So if a staff person gets it, um, you can't operate at half staff. Your, your risk management protocols are built around a specific student to staff ratio as well. Imagine. So, so an organization in Ireland recently came out and they normally have their housing sort of facility, you know, facilities all set up and they were running through all the protocols and they've got an eight page list of documentation. So think of all of the time that went into developing that the expertise they had to build in consulting. And what they realized was, OK, we can have our primary house, but if someone gets coronavirus while they're on program, Program, or during quarantine, we have to have a secondary, completely separate quarantine house. So that's an additional cost that they have to in invest in. Meanwhile, organizations are also saying, okay, we're trying to keep costs down because we know that there's economic hardship. Uh, yeah, this is hitting us for sure and hitting the field, I think, largely. I know that we're gonna we're gonna have programs running. There's 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 I I Every part of my being knows that there will be organizations and students to do this. The question will be, what exactly will their will their experiences be? Um, I'm still positive they're going to be incredibly sort of favorable experiences. That's just sort of, I mean, even I've sent student home students home from a program sort of for breaking rules, and eight out of ten times they still write back and they say that was still the best experience I ever had. I'm sorry I broke the rules. Yeah, I bet there's something you know being in ed having been in education for a long, long time and thinking about my own path through education. Um, I, I didn't do a formal gap year, but I, I am immediately sold on the benefits of it, right? I, that's me, right? But I, I can see there's so many great things, even from what, when, you, when you just mentioned somebody not even carrying the whole thing through, right? So um, Jane, can we turn to you a little bit? Because as I'm a listening to Ethan and as I'm thinking about questions I wanna ask him, I'm thinking you, you've got to also have some really great insights into a lot of these things. Um, tell us a little bit about what you do as a gap year counselor first. Sure. Well, um, so J2 Guys was founded by myself, Jane, and my husband, Jason. That's the J squared. We've been known by friends and colleagues for 25 years. So we thought, why not finally put it on the logo? And, and Jason and I, as gap year counselors, we often tell families the best way to think about us is like we're college counselors for gap year students. So where I've been called a gap year therapist, I've been called a life coach, um, I've been called a director and uh, an instructor. Um, I think as an, as an educator at heart, um, and I'm sure all of us would agree, you know, we're, we, we're here at the ready, waiting for young adults who are standing on the cusp of question or change to help usher them through to the next step. So I want to help open doors. And, and that's the point, which is I'm not going to assert my definition of a gap year or my personal interest on a student. It's cultivating a relationship, drawing a student out, making a meaningful connection, helping fan their flames of curiosity and confidence, and then pointing them in the right direction of programs and placements that of course we've also vetted. So that is a really big right. part of what we do is vet programs. It's a, it's yeah. a huge part of the job, but honestly, in the scheme of things, you know, I could spend hours at night calling programs all over the world and putting them through the due diligence steps. But in the end, it's it's the, the waking hours of the day are really about working with the students in this kind of very personal work where they feel heard and validated for having a different potential idea of what their educational trajectory could look like if even for six months. So that's what, that's what we do. That's how we really embrace our role as, as gap year counselors. Um, and, but but in, in my elevator speech, which I should have ended about 60 seconds ago, would have really been, I'm like a college counselor. I'm, here's right. me and a student. 
here's what's out there. Let me help. I'm a matchmaker. Let me help get right. you connected. But it's I treat it as a much more, of course, comprehensive journey than that. Yeah. So you mentioned something I thought was really interesting that you don't impose your idea of what a gap year could look like. Uh, on the students that you work with. So talk a little bit more about that, That because that's the initial reaction that I often get when I'm talking to students and families is, and it's mostly when it comes up as maybe more of like a negative reaction, you know, families will say, no, 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 that's not something we would do. Because they have probably a very limited idea of what it, that it's, it's a year and it looks like one thing, you know, and they're just not buying into that. Yeah. So talk to me about like, you know, what could it look like? What is what's the what are the varieties or what's the what are the variables that might influence the shape of what a gap year looks like for a student? That's a, it's a great question, and and I think Ethan Ethan and I have known and been friends and colleagues for twenty plus years now, and uh, we've had very very parallel lives and roles, and we share so much philosophy and and strategy around this. But for for the one, the beginning part is just what, how one would kind of define a gap year. And it's very open ended. It's it's a you know in its briefest form, we talk about a gap year being an intentional period of time in which an individual is taking a pause from their current academic or career path in order to meaningfully engage in some other experiences. And I can't tell you, you know, Ethan and I are traveling the country, speaking at schools and conferences, and really trying to get this definition into people's laps so that we don't have the naysayers saying, well we don't have the budget or we don't want to go overseas. We're like, right, but you don't need a huge budget, but you don't need to go overseas. So there's a lot of myth busting involved right. in our work um, of really educating families because generally speaking, a family has read an article in a paper or has a cousin or a neighbor and they've done a thing and that thing right. doesn't suit their family. So thus it must not be an option. And, um, you know, so coming back to, I mean, there were sort of multiple parts to your question, but, what we want to get at is what the students' goals are. And so for, for us at J2 Guides, we talk a lot about, and Solly knows this all too well, what is your why? That is our starting point with every student. And I'm talking a lot about it right now with students who are still like college gap year. I'm like, well, let's talk about what is your why? What is the living and learning experience that's going to feel most enriching to you this year? What are your goals? Um, and so we always start there. What's your intention? Um, and from there, I've kind of broadened that to include um, of three other things. And, and this has been something that Jason and I have been doing a lot of um, work with our students this year, just whatever path you choose, whether it's community service, whether it's an internship, um, whether you're hoping for a place based experience or you're prepared to be virtual and from home, whether it's language or culturally focused or fine arts. Again, and I can elaborate on all those things. Let's, again, know your intention, the what is your why, and then there are three other things we're really imploring students to consider, which is structure, mentorship, and peers. So of all four together, intention, structure, mentorship, and peers. And that's sort of this loose net that we, or lens that we want students to really look through as they set up, particularly during this year, every year, but particularly with the pandemic when there's been such isolation um, and, and a desire for connection in a meaningful way. The peers and mentorship piece, I think, are absolutely critical because there will be less group travel programs or some of those more traditionally understood gap year experiences may be off the, may be off the table for this fall at a minimum. And so how can we make sure that in, in lieu of that, that students are connected to like-minded peers, that there's someone in their life who's not their parents um, an instructor, a guide, an employer, who's there to kind of be that inspiring role model. It's so much of what students talk about of getting out of gap time is these in phenomenally interested and, and interesting people who are super invested in these young adults. So that's that mentorship piece. And the structure is, it's gonna take a lot. We've all just been through three plus months. We've got a bunch more ahead. Um, people figured out some kind of band-aid measures, but now it might really be time to figure out a more longer term sustainable approach to how do I piecemeal my days? How do I make this feel hopeful and focused and productive and fun? Dare I say, yeah. can I have yeah. fun? Am I allowed to have fun right now in a pandemic? So, so those are some more macro level kind of responses, but in terms of, I just want to finally say when you asked about what kinds of things students can do, I mean, I almost hesitate to say too much because if I don't say it again, then a family doesn't hear it and they think that right. it's not an option. So I always put it back to a student and say, 
You tell me, what is your why? If you could do anything in the world, what would it be? And then let's see if we can find an outlet for it. And pretty much every time we can find a way to help a student meet that goal. That's cool. I like that. I think one of, you mentioned this, but one of the, when I think about when I speak with families and students and the, the possibility of a gap year comes up as we're talking about college planning, um, I think the most common objection I receive probably from parents, but from students too, is circling around this myth around lack of structure. You know, oh, oh my goodness, an entire year of sitting around and, and, and connected to that, the other objection I get is from parents, we couldn't possibly allow our student to do that because then they wouldn't go back to college, right? And I, I find that so interesting. I mean, of course, individual students and parents, families know their students better than me, but I just find that to be interesting and I, I but thoughtful. I don't want to judge that objection. Um, I'm assuming you hear that too. Yes. And I, I think for um, first generation college students, there is a legitimate um, bigger concern around will this derail, will a gap year derail the college process? And, and these are always really important questions to be asking. Um, more often than not, almost exclusively with a lot of families we work with, um, what the gap year does is actually re refill the well. It refuels the student to such an extraordinary degree. Historically, the number one reported reason why students are taking gap years is academic burnout. Um, so this is a year of recharging and not just recharging, it's taking some of those interests you've dabbled in, in, in middle school and high school, and actually experiencing some real world application. Those four years of Spanish in a classroom got a little dull, but maybe you had the opportunity to volunteer in Costa Rica or be an au pair in Spain or something else and put the language to use and all of a sudden, oh, that's right. why I've been working so hard. And so when, when the gap year provides those small validations, oh, this I love science, I love marine biology, yes, I love engineering, yes, I'm good at this thing. We see students charging back onto the college campus after a gap year. And, and Ethan might wanna say a bit about this, is a lot of GYA's work, Gap Year Association, we're a field of acronyms. Um, that, you know, in fact, students are, are going back to college in, in incredibly high numbers and performing quite extraordinarily. And I would actually love to pass this off to Ethan and let him do say something about this, because this is so much of the amazing work GYA has, has done. Yeah. Um, um, so, so as I mentioned earlier, one of our four pillars is about research. And so uh, in 2015, um, we did the National Alumni Survey, which was the largest effort to gather research uh, about gap year students' outcomes. We're repeating that right now, actually. There's a, a current survey tool that's open until the end of July um, uh, where we're, we're trying to understand again in 2020, what, what's that looking like? Um, and interestingly enough, we actually will probably pull a few students who were on their spring programs resulting from coronavirus. So it'll be some very interesting data analysis. But um, um, to Jane's point, what we're finding is that students are returning back to school, back to a four-year degree within one year to the tune of 90% after completing their gap year. And for us, I think it's really important to emphasize that, that that's a structured, intentional gap year. That's not, mm -hmm. that's not, I'm gonna go work at Dairy Queen, don't get me wrong, a blizzard is my first stop on every, on every road trip. But, but it's, it's, it's more than that. It's, it's, it's very well enshrined by those four principles that you just outlined, Jane, you know, that, that, that component of mentorship. You, you can't just do it all yourself. And I think that's a large part of, of any educational sort of outcome is it, it's, it's not done in a vacuum. It's done in, in concert. And so, um, so that tune of 90%, that's a very important number that I hope will, will sort yeah. of tamp down a few parental concerns. But the other piece that you were alluding to is, is that, uh, that, that, that idea of academic atrophy, right? Where, where if I go away, my brain's not gonna be working and then it's just gonna turn to mush and, and I won't be a good student when I get back. And inevitably what we find, again, from that intentional gap year is that students come back more engaged. In essence, imagine spending 12 years in theory land and now you get to see theory and practice, you're gonna yeah. connect those pieces in a much more profound way and have a, a sort of an actual personal relationship with them. And that's a large part of the outcomes that we see from a gap year. Their GPAs are improved, over improved from, uh, and that's been a study done by Bob Cleggett, formerly at Middlebury and Harvard, now at hmm. Colorado College. Bob Cleggett's chairing the gap year research consortium at Colorado College. 
Great. So 90% go on to enroll in college after their intentional structured gap year. You know, a lot of the students and families that I work with over many, many years think their first go-to in taking a year before starting a four-year or maybe more is community college. I live in, I operate in California and we're very fortunate in California to have a very robust community college system. And it's a, it's a valid choice. It's a good choice. Um, I'm a big fan of community college education, but you know, the nationally, the statistics for students who enroll in community college with the intention of going on to a four-year university as a vertical transfer are below 50%. That's remarkable, right? That's a statistic that I certainly don't, families would not want their students to be a part of. So, um, Solly, I want to come to you, but before we do that, Jane and or Ethan, another, I think, again, objection or myth around that I'm hearing right now, especially with the pandemic, is uh, it could be a good idea for a gap year, but it, it's a non-starter because nothing's open. It's not going to be safe. What would you possibly do anyways and I'm starting to hear little trickles, and you might know more than me, that colleges are starting to push back a little bit and said, saying, hey, y'all can't take a gap year all at once. We, we need to have a class next year. Um, where do you, what are you, what are, what is, how do you respond to those objections? And, or, and are you hearing them? And what are you hearing colleges saying for this immediate upcoming year, the year that Solly would be enrolling? Um, I mean, they're all, every question should be on the table. We can't be afraid to have these really transparent conversations as families about our concerns. And, you know, we say a lot to families and to students, you know you best. So really trust if you have a student who this could kind of derail some momentum or my kid's not a virtual learner. I mean, that's the big one is like I mm -hmm. everything. The first question I ask every student before what is your why is how did the spring go? How was that for you? You know, and sometimes like but I didn't love it, but it was fine. Others said, yeah, I'm not that was not successful for me. And mm -hmm. these students are so smart. You know, they're like, OK, we know it's going to be better in the fall. Everyone's going to figure it out. But it wasn't great for me. So we have to start with where a student feels like that's, again, where will you be most successful as a living and learning experience? Um, mm -hmm. And I think students can answer that best for themselves. So look, as Ethan start off by saying maybe 20 minutes ago, you know, whatever befalls the colleges, of course, befalls all of us. And so um, if everything's virtual for university, then yes, it will be for gap year. The benefits is it will be tremendously less expensive. It's not something we've talked a lot about yet, but the virtual opportunities being open to students are dropping most costs in half. Colleges are not doing that in the same way. So um, there's a tremendous semester program based in the Bay Area that's launching a 12 week virtual semester. It's gonna have the intention, structure, mentorship and peers and it's for $8,000. I don't say that lightly. That could be a stretch for any of us in this call, but that would normally be a semester pushing 15 to 20,000. So I think that financially, though it's gonna be so much access to amazing opportunities. And while they have this visual FaceTime component, um, if it's still gonna be more experientially focused, that still could be for the right student, a better option than an intensely academic one. So I think that's really important to look at. Um, and then, you know, as a strategy, and this is something that, you know, I, we're talking a lot about with our students is, once we hone in on a student's primary and fundamental goals of a gap year, um, and usually there are two or three or four kind of major areas of interest I try to sort of get my students to articulate, we happen to call them their anchors, um, I ask students to create a plan A, B, or C for each one. And your plan A is your optimal COVID, you, you got nothing on me, we got this. Uh, dream big. Again, that's where as a counselor or a parent or an educator, we get to see the passion in our students. So I need to see that. Our plan B is a hybrid version, a modified. So maybe it's not Spain, but maybe Costa Rica is still on the table. Um, and then plan C is a fully virtual. But regardless of A, B or C, they're all hinged on the achievement of this singular goal. So it's Spanish, it's engineering, it's service. Um, it's politics, whatever it could be. And we make sure that every student is heading off into this year with a really you know, well-rounded set of options because things are still, of course, as we're seeing, changing daily. Um, and to me, in the world that we're living in today, that is as sound an approach to the next steps in life as anything else that's out there. 
Yeah. So I'll Absolutely. pause there and see if Ethan wants to add anything to that. <laughs> Uh, that was I was uh, well walked. Uh, sometimes we we talk about walking the circle in our field, and that was that was a well walked circle, Jane. Um, yeah, I, I think sort of to 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 name it, some of it is is talking about sort of investing in skills or specific sort of certifications. Um, those are things that you can carry forward. They can be done somewhat online, somewhat in person. Um, I'm seeing a lot of innovation in organizations saying uh, uh, we're going to go online. That's where sort of the base plate is. But but as things open up or as there's opportunities, again, we'll do a, a sort of a brief foray into a specific channel. Um, um, also, you know, the advent of online internships, um, that's something that's also starting to catch fire in some really interesting ways. Um, um, I mean, let's be honest, uh, students opportunities this fall will probably be really, well, they know probably around it. They will be reduced. Um, mm -hmm. um, there will be some opportunities for international. I guarantee you there will be some operations running internationally this fall. And then a lot of organizations are, are frankly, you know, holding out that we might have a vaccination or treatment protocols will be radically improved. So that comes spring, you know, normally we would prefer to have a sort of the overabundance of structure at the front end of the program and more independence and flexibility for learning on the tail end. Um, we might actually see, you know, the, the sort of, you know, the online environment be the front end. And then come spring is when students are really able to, to, to you know, take the ceiling off and really explore a little bit more. That's interesting. That's an interesting flip to the kind of the pedagogical model that kind of probably serves these types of experiential programs really well, but it sounds like it's necessary. Solly, you're being patient. <laughs> I'm thinking of all these great things that you're probably wanting to respond to as we're talking about you, right? You know, you're, you're the prime example of what we're all talking about. So can you tell us, um, you're a recent, recent high school graduate, congratulations. Tell us what your plans are for this upcoming year. Yeah, so, um, I mean, firstly, I can't emphasize enough how much Ethan and Jane have hit the nail on the head um, with my approach to um, this coming year. And I think to respond to your question, it's, it's not as simple as it might normally be. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty um, and... I'm kind of approaching the planning of my year in a three stage process. Um, so right now I'm actually having the opportunity to work two jobs um, at uh, an outdoors company as a zip line canopy tour guide um, and as a kind of groundskeeper and set builder production assistant at a, an experimental theater company. Um, mm. So that's going to run into the fall for me. And I've been able to structure my gap year so that I have this reliable, consistent, um, productive activity at the forefront of the year so that I have more space to plan, um, you know, for my winter and spring, um, and really to imagine as, as I would like to, because it takes a lot of imagination. And I think, um, what hit home the most for me, in the, the J2 Explore the Gap program was the wayfinding section. That's all mm -hmm. about asking the what is your why um, and figuring out anchors. Um, so, so like Jane was mentioning, I'm working with anchors um, for kind of a fall trimester, a winter and a spring. Um, so just simply my, my fall trimester is focused around this paid work. Um, and simultaneously I'm gaining experience in, um, fields that are really important to me. Um, I'm going into, uh, school as a theater major in 2021. So I'm getting hands-on experience that I do not doubt will benefit me throughout my, um, educational experience in college. Um, and, and yeah, I'm also thinking creatively about the winter where I'm focusing on volunteer work and hopefully Spanish. Um, you know, I think I wasn't intending to take a gap year three, four months ago. Um, I was uh, planning to just head straight into school. I had a very intense many month um, college application process. Um, and so I kind of hadn't asked that what is my why question for even going to school in the following year. Um, and so kind of my original why was COVID-19. Um, 
and that kind of hmm. opened the floodgates for all these other reasons that I want to um that I want to take time off and experience the world um and at the forefront of that has definitely been assisting communities um around me in the u s um with the covid nineteen pandemic um and with many the many other crises we're facing uh I'm a climate activist, and so I'm going to be taking this time to dive deeper into um, climate activism and uh, racial injustice work. Um, so right now, the winter is my, you know, volunteer Spanish um, anchor. And, you know, in an ideal world, I might be going to Costa Rica and getting an experience in Spanish immersion um, while volunteering in perhaps teaching English or something. That's uh, one of the programs that was referred to me. Um, but I also have this this anchor that applies to work um, in the US, um, perhaps in New Mexico where, my, uh, where I have a, a place to live and I could go help with COVID-19 relief where it's hitting mm-hmm. hard in the Navajo Nation. And if you know things are even more restricted, there are plenty of organizations in my area in Western Massachusetts um, where I can do this work that is really important to me. So it sounds like you're really comfortable with having some fluid planning in as the months unfold. Yeah, I I think um, personally one one thing that I've realized in planning this gap year is that. I am very accustomed to structure um, and Hmm. having a structure laid out for me uh, as a high school student, especially at a a school where I'm there um, probably more time than most high school students. Um, I would kind of leave my house at like 7 a.m. and get home at like 6.30 p.m. Um, So my, my days have been filled with structure created by wonderful educators, um, and artists, but now uh, I, I'm using this as an opportunity to learn how to create structure for myself. Um, and I think mm. for any concerned parent um, that wants to counter the possibility of a gap year with that um, worry about a lack of structure, I would challenge them and say, this is actually the perfect opportunity for a student to learn how to create this structure for themselves um, before going back into the college experience where things are more laid out for you, you know, so once they come out of that, they already have a grounding in what it's like to kind of function in the real world, um, and be a working, um, a working adult. So I'm, although things are fluid and more unpredictable than ever, I'm kind of learning how to create as much of a structure as possible or uh kind of like something to fall back into um regardless of the circumstances kind of like a some sort of mind map where you know one happening leads to some circumstance or some um some program or job or something that aligns with my goals in the first place right well that's you know that's a lot of 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 when, when adults talk about their paths through career and life and big decisions and um, it, looking back, at least I've found, um, when we look back and describe our path, it makes sense. But as we're in it, right, it's being comfortable with what you just described, right? Having a plan, maybe some other plans, hoping to see some connections to, from one thing to lead to another, but not feeling like you have to have a lockstep thing put in place. I suppose you can, but oftentimes it doesn't really work out that way. So I love, I think you're, you know, you're thinking like, like adults, right? You said something too, that I thought was really interesting. You said, if I'm hearing you correctly, um, and maybe this is, I think something, if I'm hearing this correctly, I think a lot of students your age, or maybe the year or two younger, still in high school, approaching this college, this transition, right? Leaving high school, probably college, maybe gap year, whatever. You you said something that I think a lot of people are thinking about, that around the pandemic, that maybe that was the spark of what made you think about a gap year in the first place, right? But something clicked for you and helped you to get over it in terms of 
not just thinking about it in terms of I college won't be what I want it to be. So I'm just going to take time off. Right. It sounds like you've taken it much further, probably with the assistance of people like Jane being really thoughtful about that. But can you tell what's your, I guess, what's your advice to other students, to your peers? How do, how would you encourage them to flip the switch? If, if they're thinking it's just a pandemic, I, I couldn't possibly go to college for that reason alone. That's a good question. I think um, to bring it back to what we've been talking about the entire time is to to ask, you know, pro- likely everybody is on some some path, whether it's a path that someone else has laid out for them or that they've kind of put out for themselves. For me, it was going to college next year um, and I think I was asked, I ended up asking, why would I go to college for theater next year if I'm going to be doing acting classes over Zoom and I'm paying an immense amount of money? Um, and I would kind of challenge students. It's, it's definitely a challenge because it's uncomfortable to face the idea that what you're kind of track is is not in alignment with what might be most beneficial for you but I would challenge students to really ask um, why they're doing what they're doing um, and to kind of follow the the thread from there um, because there's probably a reason that they might not want to head to college the following year um, whether or not that has to do with COVID-19. Yeah. What's your biggest fear about this upcoming year? I think initially my fear was, uh, was that I would fall out of, or it was that I would start without structure and that that would kind of seep into the rest of my year. And that I, if I didn't have kind of a solid enough grounding, um, in the beginning of my summer that I would push things back and procrastinate and never, um, never make the perfect gap experience. Um, and I think there are a few reasons that that has kind of, that fear has kind of been assuaged. Um, and I'm feeling pretty comfortable right now. The first thing is that I, I was honest with myself about that and I looked for solutions. Um, and that came in the Mm -hmm. form of, you know, applying for jobs so that I had, something that I was working with, you know, as I was planning my gap year, I, I had a, a foundation um, that I could work from. And it's especially helpful that that will transition, help me transition into the year itself. Um, and also working, you know, with J2 guides, I'm a fairly structured person in general, and I've been pretty organized and successful in high school. But um I don't think there's any shame in seeking out some advice from people who have years and years of experience with, um, with these kinds of, um, with these kinds of things. Um, and for me throughout high school, mentorship has been really important to my learning experience, whether that be my own teachers or, um, actors that I've met in theaters that I've worked with or, um, my college counselor. So I was looking for mentors. Um, and I was honest with myself about my fears. Uh, so it it was really just kind of following what I knew. Um, and I'd say also coming to terms with the fact that there is no perfect gap year. There's, there was no one way that this could go. And we're all getting used to, um, living, in ways we didn't expect to live in a few months ago. So um, it's it's really just that brutal honesty with myself that doesn't turn out to be that brutal. Yeah. Well, I love that you're talking about approaching the planning and your hopes and dreams and your fears in a way that y- y- is really reflecting you, who you are, at least now in your life and in this transition. And I'm hearing that that, that's probably one of the biggest 
uh, pieces of advice that anyone should take away from this. If they're, if they're going to approach planning a gap year is there's not a perfect one. I love that. You said that more than once. And I think that's just golden, but it's also, you got to craft this in a way that's true to you, right? Just like you have to craft choosing college and career and friends and family. And hopefully, hopefully we all have those choices open to us in a way that reflects who we are. So I'm, I'm, you're making me really hopeful that you're going to have a remarkable year um, because of the way you're approaching it. So I could talk about this for hours and days because this is just fascinating. And all of you have so much wonderful things to say about this. You know, is there anything else that we haven't mentioned that you, you any of you want to share with, with our viewers? I mean, the, the only thing that comes to mind and, and Jane, you, you, you must be a proud mama right now. So you're representing all of us very well. Um, <laughs> thank you for the good work and the courage that it's taken to, to apply your own path. I think there's something intrinsic about, about the courage to sort of, um, find your own path, uh, and, and not be afraid of, of what that might mean or say about you. Um, ultimately for me, one of the most positive outcomes from a, from a good gap year, an intentional gap year is, is that you walk away with a better understanding of what success means for you. So, so to me, um, I think, I think sort of we, as a, as a sort of a culture, as a species, take our definitions of success by what we're exposed to. But, but very, very infrequently do we have the time or, or, or the courage or, or the support to ask, what does that mean for you? So if you want to drive a BMW, great, more power to you. But, but do it for your reasons, not because you're keeping up with the Joneses. And I think a large part of what we're talking about in the gap year field is a really, a, it's, it's about sort of, you know, that Venn diagram of, of, of what do you love to do? What's the world need? What can you get paid to do? Um, um, what's your expression? It's like, it's like, What's the world's sort of need? What's your unique gifts and how do you pair them together? All of us at some core level want life to mean something. And we don't do that in a vacuum. We do that, you know, with our neighbors, with the, the, the four-legged, the two-legged, the winged, you know, the, 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 the trunked, uh, you know, we live in a more interdependent world than we ever have before. And, and I think it's really important to understand and recognize that. And, and I think a purposeful gap year is about recognizing, you know, who are you within yourself and who are you in the world that's around you? Because we're not products again in a vacuum. We're all interdependent at a, at a much greater weight than we ever have been before. And, and this pandemic, is, it's, it's, it's writing that large on the screen. The Black Lives Matter movement, it's writing that large on the screen. And happily, I think we're, 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 we're met with a, a generation of youth that are, are standing up, raising their hands, saying, this is a lot to take on, but, but we're willing to embrace it because there's a need and, and that's what we want to do. Well, I can't thank all of you enough for your time today. This has just been wonderful. Um, Hopefully we'll have you back, Solly, <laughs> midway or at the end of your gap year, and you'll dazzle us with all the remarkable things that you've done. <laughs>